Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on October 17th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Later on this hour, we're going to speak with a biologist and with a lawyer. They're warning against a dredging project in Puerto Rico that will harm coral reefs. But first up, we're going to look at a range of issues here in Florida, including an attempt at consolidating judicial circuits. And joining me by Zoom right now is our guest, Andrew Warren. He was twice elected to be the state attorney for Hillsborough County, but he was suspended by Governor Ron DeSantis. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Andrew. Sean, thanks so much for having me back. I'm really glad you could join us to talk about this uh, this interesting issue. So Republicans in Florida, some of them are trying to consolidate a few of the judicial circuits. Right now, there are 20. They say that these new districts would be more efficient. Do you agree with that? I don't at all. I mean, look, this is a naked power grab uh, by Tallahassee and the Republican leadership there. And this is great if you're one of the 22 people in that inner circle in Tallahassee. But it's really bad if you're one of the 22 million Floridians who relies on the criminal justice system for uh, all different parts of our society. And part of these meetings have been in public, but in November, they're going to have some closed door meetings. Um, why are you concerned about that? Well, Florida has a sunshine law in which uh, the government is supposed to operate out in the public transparently so that everybody can see what they're doing. Uh, the governor has shown that he really doesn't care about uh, the Sunshine Law. He doesn't care about a lot of laws, frankly, but he just recently got in trouble uh, for violating Sunshine Law with regard to COVID. And now they're doing it again. They're holding these meetings in private so that the public doesn't have a chance to see and hear how the future of the criminal justice system in the state of Florida is going to be uh, twisted and turned and ultimately gerrymandered uh, for political reasons. So what might that look like if if there is this redistricting that happens with these judicial circuits where, again, we're not talking about um, uh, congressional redistricting or other things that people might be familiar with that happens kind of routinely every 10 years or so. Uh, but this is judicial circuits being kind of reapportioned. What might that look like and why would that be an issue? Well, let's start with what these circuits represent. This is access for people in the community to their court system. And so whether you've been the victim of a crime, whether you've been the victim of a, a scam, whether you need to go to court to make sure that you, know, you have your rights as a tenant, to make sure you have your rights as a citizen, you rely on access to the courthouse. And right now we have 20 circuits in Florida. They are set up so that people can travel relatively easily uh, to the different courts in that circuit where they elect the state attorney and the public defender and judges who work in those circuits. And it's worked really well. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But the governor and the speaker are intent on changing those circuits for political reasons. And the impact of that is not only that it takes power away from the people in the communities, power over who they can elect, who, they, who gets to serve as judges, it's going to make it harder for people to get access into the courthouse. It's going to create massive gridlock in the system. You're going to have victims having to travel longer distances to show up in court. You're going to have victims waiting longer and longer to get the justice that they deserve. There's frankly no reason to do it other than partisan politics. But unfortunately, that is what Tallahassee does these days. They don't care about what's best for Floridians. They care about what's best for them. You just called it partisan earlier in the interview. You said it was a naked power grab. Now, I think that it it um, stands to reason people can really understand how uh, judicial, uh, how redistricting for congressional districts or for state legislative seats or something, how that might be partisan. So how is it that something as neutral, perhaps as seemingly neutral, at least as judicial circuits, how can that be something that could benefit one party over another? Well, if the state redraws those circuits to favor certain political parties and certain political candidates, then that is partisan gerrymandering. And you don't have to take my word for it. Take the word of the Republican state attorney down in South Florida in Monroe County in the Keys, who said, look, everybody knows what this is about. This is about making sure that Andrew Warren can't win re-election in Hillsborough County. This is about making sure that a Democrat can't win election in Hillsborough County. This is about making sure that Republicans can win elections 
in Hillsborough County and the Orlando area. That's what it is. And again, that's coming from members of the governor's own party who are saying, don't do this. We know what you're doing. It's bad for Floridians. It may help your floundering presidential campaign, but this is not what Florida wants, not what Florida needs, and it's bad for the citizens. Our guest is Andrew Warren. He was twice elected to be state attorney for Hillsborough County, but he has since been suspended by Governor Ron DeSantis. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. So let's talk specifically here about Hillsboro and the possibility of it being redistricted. So if Hillsboro's judicial circuit, which right now just maybe almost unique among Florida counties, is its own state attorney's district uh, or, or circuit, so how if that's redistricted, how would that impact your decision about whether to run again for state attorney? Well, again, just to go back a second, I mean, there are a few single county circuits in the state and they're based on the size. And Hillsborough County is a large county, you know, 1.5 million people. And so we want to make sure that the county is set up and the circuit is set up in a way that people have access to the courts and they have they have control over the people that they elect and they put into office. Clearly, the governor is hostile to that idea that the people get to decide who serves an elected office. But the way this could happen is they could change Hillsborough County. They could combine it with other counties. Look, we don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you this. The, power, the powers that be in, in Tallahassee know exactly what they're going to do. And if you think that this is some, you know, open process where they're going to take input from the people and then make a decision that's best for Floridians, you've been living under a rock in this state. I mean, the governor and the speaker know exactly what they're going to do. They're going through a dog and pony show right now to make it look like they're getting input and figuring it out. And they're going to make a decision based on what they think is best for them politically. Based on reporting from the Tampa Bay Times, they're saying that some Republicans are saying that Governor DeSantis and the Republican sheriffs in Hillsborough County and Polk County oppose changing the boundaries of the Hillsborough circuit. Uh, do you do you find that likely that they're they're going to change a lot of things in, in Florida, but just leave Hillsborough kind of the way it is? I, I can't speculate about what they're doing. Again, they're having these meetings behind closed doors, and you'd have to go into the governor's mind to know exactly how he's going to try to mess with what's working in Florida. But I, it's understandable that law enforcement is opposed to this. I mean, we have a really good balance right now between state attorneys and judges and law enforcement. By consolidating circuits, you're minimizing the role of law enforcement, making them report to a single state attorney over multiple counties. You're Again, you're spreading the justice system too thin that denies access to a lot of people. That's why law enforcement is opposed to this. That's why every single elected state attorney in the state is opposed to it. The only person who is not opposed to it is the illegally appointed state attorney here in Hillsborough County who just says, well, whatever the governor wants, that's where I stand on it. That's not what's representing the best interests of people in Hillsborough or the people of Florida. Let's go back on something you just said, the illegally appointed state attorney in in Hillsborough County. Now, um, you know, but from a functioning standpoint, she is the state attorney. She's she's acting like that. She her the employees there report to her and so forth. Why do you say illegally appointed? Well, I, you hit the nail on the head. She's acting like the state attorney. I mean, she's not the duly elected state attorney. She's not even the lawfully appointed state attorney. And that's not my opinion. That's a fact. A federal court found very clearly that Governor DeSantis broke state and federal law in suspending me. And the governor's power to appoint somebody is conditioned on his ability to lawfully suspend someone. He didn't lawfully suspend me, which means he doesn't have the power to lawfully appoint someone in my place. And again, that's not just my opinion. I mean, you have legal scholars from across the state of Florida, a former attorney general, a former Supreme Court justice saying this appointment is illegal. It violates the Florida Constitution. I mean, I'm glad that things are kind of working, you know, that the system didn't just grind to a halt. But you have someone in there who's not elected, not accountable to the people, not appointed lawfully. That's not how democracy works. That is really bad for the people of Hillsborough County, and it's a bad omen for the state. So in order to kind of challenge what had happened to you and um, you went to court and the court found that a lot of the things you're saying are true, but that the, the judge didn't have any anything to um, any way to give you that position back. 
Well, are there any other legal uh, avenues open to you? Are there any court cases that are still going on? Where does all that stand? Yeah, so, and let's be clear, it's not that the judge said a lot of what I'm saying is correct. The judge said everything I said was correct as a matter of law. And the judge's findings, again, were crystal clear. The governor broke state and federal law in suspending me. The suspension was illegal and unconstitutional. And that I had done my job and I had done it well, exactly in the way that I had told voters that I would. Now, the judge said, as a federal judge, I don't think I have the jurisdiction to reinstate you. And that issue is now on appeal to the higher federal court. And we're patiently awaiting the decision from the federal court. But keep in mind, Sean, I mean, this has never been about just me and my position as state attorney. This is not just about the position of the state attorney in Hillsborough County. This is about our democracy. This is about who gets to decide who's in office. This is about belief in the rule of law. We have a governor who talks about the rule of law, talks about the Constitution. But when he was told by a federal judge that he had broken the law, the governor's reaction was, oh, well, so what? This works for me politically. That is a terrible thing for our state. And another reaction that the governor had, uh, whether it was specific to the what the, happened in the courts or not, was that he also suspended Monique Worrell from the Orange Osceola Ninth Circuit, the state attorney there. Uh, what are your thoughts about that suspension? I mean, that appears to be another politically motivated stunt. You know, the governor suspended me so that he had this fake talking point in his stump speech, and he suspended state attorney Worrell when his you know, presidential campaign was crashing for like the third or fourth or fifth time. Um, apparently, that's what he felt like he needed to do so that he can move up from fifth to fourth in the New Hampshire primary. But State Attorney Worrell has filed suit and we'll have to see what the court says. I and mean, again, on its face, it appears to be illegal and unconstitutional, but that's what we have courts for. And that's why I go back to in my case again, don't take my word for it. Just read the, read the opinion, read what the judge said, that this was an unconstitutional political stunt pulled by the governor to promote his own, uh, promote his own political brand. Our guest is Andrew Warren. He was twice elected to be state attorney for the Hillsborough for Hillsborough County, but he is suspended by Governor Ron DeSantis. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And uh, you were you uh, sent out this tweet maybe a week ago or a few days ago that the office staff from acting Hillsborough State Attorney Lopez that they've contributed to her campaign, and that you think that there's an ethical concern with that. Lay all that out for us. Yeah, so it, it's really unfortunate. Um, you know, the the illegally appointed acting state attorney has announced that she's running for state attorney, which, of course, she's entitled to do. And she's raising money for her campaign, which, of course, she's entitled to do. And her disclosures came out and she's taking campaign contributions from people in the office. Now, that is problematic. You know, when you have the power to fire somebody, to accept contributions from them is coercive and unethical. I mean, even if people want to voluntarily, and I use that word in air quotes, you know, if they really want to contribute, there becomes this coercive, uh, you know, factor in it where, okay, well, the person next to me contributed. Now I feel like I have to, otherwise they're going to get special treatment in the office. Look, when I, when I was state attorney, I said from the beginning, I'm never going to accept contributions from anyone in the office. That goes back to my time as a federal prosecutor. You couldn't even accept, you know, lunch from someone who you had supervisory authority over. And so the idea that you're going to bring pay to play politics into our criminal justice system in our office is, is frankly just a desperate move by someone who doesn't care about what's going on in the community, but is only there to make sure that she's doing what's best for her. That's a really bad thing for the state attorney's office and for Hillsborough. You filed paperwork, elections paperwork. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you're for sure going to run? And if if uh, you might run, what are some of your options? Yeah, I mean, the paperwork that we fired is filed, excuse me, is ministerial. I mean, this is just what candidates have to do as they're making a decision. Um, I, I've said from the beginning, my focus has been on being back to the job that I was elected to serve twice. You know, there's still over a year left in my term, and we've had this court case going on for over a year now. So for over a year, the people of Hillsborough County have been deprived of the state attorney that they elected. 
that they chose. The state attorney who frankly helped crime come down more than 30% in five years. The state attorney who followed through on the promises that he made as a candidate to invest in safety, to focus on all these different things that our community wanted from rehabilitation and mental health care and you know, conviction review unit and stopping the criminalization of poverty. That's what this is about. So the following the paperwork, look, I have to wait and see what's going on with a court case to see what's going on with the redistricting and make the decision about what's best for the state attorney's office in the state of Florida. But right now, my focus has been where it always has been over the last year plus, which is on defending democracy and the rule of law and making sure that elections still have meaning in the state of Florida, even though Ron DeSantis is the governor. Our guest is Andrew Warren. He was twice elected to be state attorney in Hillsborough County, but he was suspended by Governor Ron DeSantis. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting live on October 17th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And if you have any questions, why don't you shoot us an email at dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. Uh, David writes in um, thanking us for having this guest, for having Andrew Warren on the show. And uh, David writes, I'm so tired of DeSantis and his vindictive streak. I'm especially angry about how he has ruined New College. I think there should be a big scandal to bring DeSantis down. And um, David is asking if you could speak about Ron DeSantis's wife's influence on the governor. Is that something you can talk about? I, I can't. I mean, I don't know the intricacies of their relationship. And, you know, I, I, I know what I read, but... You know, it, it, David makes a really good point about what's happening, and it's not just new college, right? You know, it used to be that Republicans and Democrats, people disagreed about the best way to effectuate goals that we agreed upon. How can we make Florida better? How can we make our economy stronger, our healthcare system better, our schools better? Now, this the governor has taken us down this path of, you know, these cultural war issues about fighting about woke poetry and pizza ovens in New York and things that really don't matter to most people. And frankly, that's probably why he's flailing in the presidential campaign, because people have seen that he's not one to solve problems. He's one to create issues and just politicize everything. People are sick and tired of that. We also got a text message from Randy in Palm Harbor who says, um, he says uh, he doesn't understand how the present governor can break the law without recourse. Is there no law in place to disallow this? So um, you've kind of touched on that before in this interview and in other interviews. But um, how would you address Randy's question if there's no place in the law to disallow having the governor break the law without recourse? Well, Randy, it's a great question. I mean, look, there are two things. One is you have the court system. So in Florida, there have been so many examples of the governor breaking the law, violating the rights of the people who he's supposed to protect their rights. He has passed and championed these laws that violate people's free speech, free assembly, voting rights, and the courts have struck a lot of those laws down and said, governor, you can't do that, it's unconstitutional. The other part of this though, is we the people have to make sure that we are electing leaders who with every fiber of their being believe in the law, not people who are willing to violate the spirit of the law or the letter of the law when it you know, helps them politically, but people who are actually willing to do everything they can to follow the law. When they put their hands on the Bible and swear that they're going to uphold the laws of Florida and the United States, we should take that oath seriously. Unfortunately, the governor didn't take his seriously, and a lot of people in Florida really don't seem to mind, but now that's changing as these abuses of power come more to light. You know, there's been a lot of uh, talk in recent elections about election integrity. There's a group of people maybe um, throughout the country who are are saying that the elections they're drawing they're trying to draw attention to the fact that they think that elections aren't aren't uh, um, being uh, elections officials aren't being honest and there's even threats against elections officials. How is there a way to guard against this kind of disinformation and also to kind of protect the integrity of our election system? Yeah, Sean, it's a great question. It all starts at the top and it starts with having a governor who is going to speak the truth about our elections 
And Governor DeSantis did at one point speak the truth. After the 2020 election, the governor said that Florida had a completely safe and secure election, which we did. There was no evidence of wrongdoing here. The crazy conspiracy theories that said there were were shot down by the courts. You know, there were just no substantiation whatsoever. They were just crazy lies that, you know, were generated out on the internet that had no basis whatsoever. But then the governor did a 180 and said, you know what? Actually, because Trump and his followers think that there are problems with elections. So let me say that there are problems with the election. So let's start this election police force to crack down on what the six cases of where there was voting fraud out of 10 million votes cast. I mean, you're more likely to be struck by lightning twice than to have voter fraud in the state of Florida. But the governor has sent mixed messages on it. And that leads to a lot of the disinformation that people have and the distrust in one of the most fundamental aspects of our government, the fact that the people vote and the winner of the election gets to serve in office. Well, we have another email coming in. This one is from Gainesville. Uh, they say it's from your hometown, wishing that, and this person says that they're wishing that you would run again for political office, maybe governor of Florida. So um, putting you on the spot, is that something that you might do one day? I mean, look, I'm trying to figure out what's happening next week and next month. And you're asking me about what's happening in 2026 or beyond. It's, uh, it's really high praise when you have people who know what you stand for and say, we, we believe in your leadership. We trust your vision. We want you to run for higher office. But it goes back to what I said earlier in the, in the interview, Sean. I mean, my focus is on what happened to me and what's happening to the voters of Hillsborough County and how people across the state of Florida and making sure that our democracy and our elections still have meaning here. I want to remind people that our guest is Andrew Warren. He was elected state attorney twice for Hillsborough County, but was suspended by Governor Ron DeSantis. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from WMNF. We got a text message that came in that is asking, um, I'm not sure if this is something that uh, is, is necessarily in your wheelhouse, but they're asking about uh, the recent success of Republicans in local Hillsborough County elections. They won some seats on uh, Hillsborough County Commission recently. And if if they if that's attributable, this person is asking whether that's attributable to, to the recent growth in West Hillsborough County, like Town and Country and West Chase. Any thoughts on that? Yes. I mean, look, democracy is not a spectator sport. You have to show up. And in 2022, 20, uh, Republicans showed up and they were you know, motivated by a governor who had been doing some good things here. They were motivated against, you know, th their opposition to President Biden. And when people show up and they vote, those elections have consequences. And, and so here you had a situation where Republicans turned out, Democrats didn't, and they won some seats. And just like you had the opposite back in 2018, where Democrats turned out in mass and they won seats. So, you know, I think there's a healthy balance to that. It's part of the pendulum of our politics. It swings back and forth. But what we have to make sure is that we're having that pendulum swing within the arena of reasonableness, people who care about public service, not about self-promotion, people who care about the rule of law, people who care about solving problems for our communities. And once we're within that arena of actually making things better for the people who live in our community and state and country, then the back and forth of the politics is probably a healthy thing for our republic. Since we're talking about some of the um, issues about turnout, voter turnout, uh, typically 2024, you might expect to be a high turnout for Democrats in Florida because of the presidential election. There's two ballot measures in Florida, or there, there's likely to be or possibly will be two ballot measures that might also enhance that turnover. Do you have any thoughts? Do you want to give any comments about either the recreational marijuana initiative or about the um, access to abortion initiatives that might be on the ballot in 2024? Let people vote. That's my take on it. Let people vote. I mean, we can have a hour long conversation about the pros and cons of that, you know, in, in terms of the marijuana, I think I, I see it from a slightly different perspective than a lot of people, because I see it from the problems it poses in the criminal justice system and the violent crime that the illegal marijuana trade generates. In terms of the uh, pro-choice amendment, I mean, I'm pro-choice, I'm a Democrat. I, I was suspended for speaking out and my beliefs for being pro-choice. But I believe that the Constitution is set up so that if you have these issues, 
that the people feel like deserve constitutional protection, there's a process that they can vote on it. Unfortunately, the leadership in Tallahassee just doesn't believe in that sort of democracy. Amendment 4 was passed in 2018. That was the constitutional amendment to restore the right to vote to returning citizens. It was passed overwhelmingly by Republicans and Democrats. And then the governor and his, and his cohorts in Tallahassee totally undermined the law. Now you have the attorney general who is in the pocket of the governor, not representing the people of Florida, who's saying she's going to oppose this amendment being put on the ballot. Well, why, are, why is the leadership in Tallahassee afraid of democracy working? Why are they afraid of letting the people vote on these issues? It just doesn't make sense to me. Besides, they're doing what they think is best for them, not what's best for the people of Florida. Our guest is Andrew Warren. He was twice elected to the state attorney for Hillsborough County, but was suspended by Governor Ron DeSantis. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And we have time for probably a couple more questions. So um, keeping maybe expanding to some national politics here, do you happen to have any thoughts about the movement to create term limits for U.S. Supreme Court justices? I, I do. I'm, I'm glad you asked, Sean. You know, I, public support of the Supreme Court is at an all-time low or a historic low. Um, and I think term limits are a good way to bring some accountability back from the court to the people. Um, this is such an important branch of our government, obviously, and it's the third branch. And it used to be that justices served for about 18 to 20 years. Now they're serving for 35 to 40 years. They're losing touch with the people. They're losing touch with what's going on in our communities. And so term limits is a way that you can make sure that one, people, the justices remain accountable to the people. They don't stay on there for too long. And you remove or at least minimize all the partisan fighting that goes on with every single uh, nomination. Because right now, you never know when you're going to have a, an opening on the Supreme Court. And when it happens, the parties go crazy and they fight and become super divisive. Let's get back to the days where whoever was in power nominated someone who was super qualified to be on the Supreme Court. And if they're qualified, then they're put on the court. But the term limits smooths out that process. It means that you have regular turnover with people on the court, which takes the politics out of it. And then finally, we get this question from Bubba, who asks, what are Andrew's thoughts about the chaos in the U.S. House? I think that it's an indication that the GOP has lost its way and no longer knows how to govern. It's embarrassing on a worldwide scale. And that's what Bubba is saying about the search for a Republican Speaker of the House. Look, I, this goes back to something I said before, that you have to have people in the office whose sole motivation is serving the public whose sole motivation is about solving problems to help more people achieve the American dream. And right now, in so many levels of government, and we're seeing it, you know, we're seeing it so readily in the House, you have people who feel like they are there to promote their own political brand. They feel like they are there to give a voice to the most extreme, extreme parts of our society. That's not how our country has functioned for 250 years. That's not what made us the beacon of hope and freedom throughout the world. We have to get back to serving the people and move away from this hyper-partisan political environment we see in just about every aspect of our society. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us on Tuesday Cafe, Andrew. Thanks so much. I look forward to being back. Yeah, I'm really glad you could come on. Andrew Warren is the suspended state attorney in Hillsborough County, twice elected to be the state attorney in Hillsborough.